Hi everyone, welcome to chapter 8 on microbial metabolism. So up until now, we've been learning a lot about the structure of microscopic organisms, and now we're going to take a dive inside of the microbes on a biochemical level and look at the metabolism that keeps them alive. When we think about metabolism and the word metabolism, we usually associate it with our own bodies. So we think about digestion and breaking down nutrients, and that's all true. These things do happen in our own bodies, but we less often think about the fact that microscopic organisms also have metabolisms. So even though microbes are small, they have a highly complex metabolism, just like we do, and inside of any microscopic cell, including tiny prokaryotes, there is a complex concert of chemical reactions that is on the order of thousands of chemical reactions happening every second just to keep the cell alive. And together, all of these reactions are called metabolism. So metabolism describes the sum total of the chemical reactions involved in the buildup and breakdown of nutrients within a cell. And it's worthwhile to note that while microbes have, in many ways, a metabolism that is similar to ours, there are certain species of microbes that have very unique metabolisms. So some species of prokaryotes are capable of using what we would consider to be very unconventional fuel sources to live off of. There are microbes, for example, out there that use cellulose as their primary fuel source, uh, cellulose is the carbohydrate that makes up the woody part of plants. There are other microbes that can live exclusively on petroleum oil. There are some that use sulfur as their primary energy source. There are some that use ammonia. The one that you see here on the right-hand side of the screen is a species called Alcanivorax borcumensis, and this is a species that is uh, one that uses petroleum as its primary fuel source for energy and it has been used quite successfully in the past as a tool to help mitigate oil spills that have occurred on land. Um, so some microbes, suffice to say, have some really unique and interesting metabolic capabilities. However, in this lecture, we are going to narrow the scope of our focus to discussing microbes that have a more conventional metabolism that is more similar to ours, um, a metabolism that is primarily based on carbohydrates. But before we look at that type of metabolism, we need to lay some foundations uh, for understanding metabolism by taking a closer look at this definition of metabolism that I provided you on the previous slide. So I stated that metabolism describes the chemical reactions involved in the buildup and breakdown of nutrients within a cell. So we can think about metabolism as having two halves to it. There is the half that's involved in the buildup of nutrients, and then there's the half that's involved in the breakdown of nutrients. The buildup of nutrients in the cell is referred to as anabolism or anabolic reactions. And the breakdown of nutrients in the cell is referred to as catabolism or catabolic reactions. So an easy way to remember this is if you, uh, if you like cats or if you own cats or are just familiar with cat behavior, um, then you know that cats like to destroy things. So if you think about catabolism, catabolic reactions, those are the reactions that break down large complex molecules into simpler ones. And catabolic reactions are usually associated with a, a release of energy. So if we think about catabolic reactions in our own bodies, an example of a catabolic reaction, or rather a series of catabolic reactions, would be those that occur after you eat a hamburger and your body takes all of the lipids or fats and the proteins and the carbohydrates in that hamburger and breaks them down through catabolic reactions and releases from those reactions energy that you can use for all of your processes. The opposite side of this equation is 
anabolism or anabolic reactions. And anabolic reactions take simple molecules and build them up into more complex ones. And these types of reactions usually consume energy. So an example of an anabolic reaction that might occur in our own bodies would be, uh, for example, after a hard workout, your muscle tissue will be developing through the buildup of protein. And as your body builds up those proteins, it is consuming the energy that is available um, and that is required to build larger complex molecules from simpler ones. So um, metabolism, as you can see in this graphic here, is a give and a take between catabolic and anabolic reactions. It is a constant cycle wherein complex molecules are being broken down through catabolic reactions into simple ones, and then those simple molecules are being built back up through anabolic reactions into more complex ones. The other thing that we want to introduce at this point is something called ATP, which you can see mentioned here and here. So we know that catabolic reactions are associated with energy being released, and energy is pretty much synonymous with ATP production. The way that energy is released from catabolic reactions is that this high energy molecule called ATP is generated. On the other hand, the way that simple molecules are built back up into complex molecules is that the ATP that the cell has generated for itself is then consumed in anabolic reactions in order to make larger molecules from the small molecules. So ATP is synonymous with energy for the cell. It is the cell's energy currency. And the reason why that is the case is because ATP has a unique structure that is able to store a very high amount of energy. This is what the structure of ATP looks like. It's called, in its long form name, adenosine triphosphate. ATP is the abbreviation for adenosine triphosphate. And it's called this because you can see that one component of its structure here is called adenine, and that's where the first part of the name adenosine is derived from. You can also see over here, there's a series of three phosphate groups, and this is where the triphosphate component of the name comes from. Now you may remember from Bio 181 that a phosphate group is a molecular component that has a negative charge associated with it. And so here in the molecule of ATP, we have three phosphate groups that are directly adjacent to each other in the structure of ATP. And you can probably imagine that three phosphate groups with three negative charges do not like to be directly adjacent to each other like this. In fact, they repulse each other very strongly, kind of like if you take the north pole of a magnet and try to force it up against the north pole of another magnet, you can physically feel the repulsion that those two magnets have for each other. So that's exactly what's happening here between these phosphate groups. They're all negatively charged, they don't like to be next to each other, but there are these very high energy chemical bonds that are holding them fixed in this position. So think about how much energy it takes you to hold those two magnets close to each other when they're repelling each other. It's a lot of energy that you're expending to do that. And so in these bonds, these, these connections are what hold the phosphate groups together, and that is where this massive amount of energy is stored. And when the cell wants to access that energy, all it has to do is break that bond that is already primed to break because of the repulsion. So in releasing one or more of these phosphate groups, here now all of the energy that was being used to hold them together, that energy is released and it can go towards some other purpose in the cell. The other beautiful thing about the molecule ATP is that it is rechargeable. So we can think about this form on the left, adenosine triphosphate, as being like the fully charged version of the battery. And when it loses a single phosphate group, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is transformed suddenly into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because now it only has two phosphate groups associated with it. 
And we can think about this version as being like the uncharged battery of the molecule. The scaffold is still there though. And so all the molecule needs to do to get recharged is have the cell add one additional phosphate group back on to the adenosine diphosphate, turning it back into adenosine triphosphate. And so this is what is happening during this concert of catabolic and anabolic reactions. The cell creates ATP by recharging ADP through the addition of a phosphate group driven by catabolism. And then ATP is expended during anabolic reactions as the cell builds up the large molecules that it needs in the process reducing ATP back to ADP. And the whole process repeats. So this is how the cell drives all of its metabolism. So let's get back to that definition of metabolism that we've been working from, because we just finished talking about catabolism and anabolism, which are the buildup and breakdown, respectively, of nutrients within the cell. But the other aspect of this definition that we haven't delved into yet is the fact that all of this buildup and breakdown is occurring through chemical reactions. All chemical reactions, including ones that happen inside of biological organisms, are governed by a series of rules that we call collision theory. And what collision theory says is that in order for a chemical reaction to occur, the molecules involved need to collide with each other with precisely the correct speed energy, and orientation. Otherwise, in the absence of even one of these factors, the chemical reaction will not happen. So if you imagine, for example, what's going on inside of your stomach right now, there are all sorts of molecules that are swimming around in there, bumping into each other, and they have the potential to chemical re chemically react with each other, but only if they run into each other with the right speed, energy, and orientation. And as it turns out, all three of these things don't happen very often together. Molecules are colliding all the time inside of living organisms, inside of cells, but rarely do they collide with the right speed, energy, and the proper orientation for them to actually stick and react with each other, as you see in this animation right here. So what this means is that chemical reactions are actually extremely rare and extremely slow to take place. And chemical reactions would not occur at a rate that is able to support living organisms were it not for a special class of molecules that help speed up these chemical reactions called enzymes. So enzymes are defined as biological catalysts. A catalyst is an agent that speeds up a chemical reaction by creating better conditions for the substrates to react. The conditions for chemical reactions, as we've just finished talking about, are normally pretty challenging. Um, there's a pretty high threshold of requirements that chemicals have to meet in order for them to react. And what enzymes do is they create a special space with the perfect conditions to facilitate the connection of the reactants, or as they are called, substrates. Enzymes are composed primarily of proteins, but they can also include helper molecules along with the protein that are not themselves composed of protein. So cofactors are one of those two possible helper molecules, and these are inorganic particles such as zinc, magnesium, and typically other metallic ions, and they help the enzyme do its job more efficiently. Coenzymes are small organic molecules that perform a similar function to cofactors. This includes things like vitamins, NAD. Altogether, these components, meaning the enzyme, along with any cofactors and or coenzymes that are involved with its reaction, are called the hollow enzyme. And there is an enzyme out there for virtually every chemical reaction that needs to happen in living cells. Every enzyme is tailor made to host a specific chemical reaction, just like the one that we see in this animation right here, 
um, this enzyme is receiving a very specific molecule that is a perfect fit for its little site right here. The molecule it is receiving is called sucrose, and then it breaks that sucrose down into two constituent pieces, which are glucose and fructose. So this is just one example of a chemical reaction, um, but there is an enzyme in biological organisms for virtually every chemical reaction that cells need to perform in the course of their metabolism. And without these enzymes, those chemical reactions would not occur often enough to support life. So how do enzymes actually make these reactions easier? Well, what they do is they tamper with a quantity called the activation energy of the reaction. Every chemical reaction, as we saw when we talked about collision theory, requires a certain amount of energy in order to occur. Even if a chemical reaction seems like it would happen spontaneously and move forward by itself, you still have to input energy initially. If you've ever heard the idiom, you have to spend money to make money, that's kind of what it's like here on a biochemical level. You have to spend a little bit of energy to get a lot of energy back. A great example that we probably are all familiar with is fire. Fire is a chemical reaction that will give off large amounts of energy, but it won't start on its own. There has to be an initial input, a little bit of energy to get that chemical reaction started in the form of a spark or a lightning strike or some friction. That's what you see on this free energy diagram right here. This initial increase is the activation energy. And what enzymes do is they make it so that less energy is required to get the chemical reaction going. They lower the threshold of that activation energy that must be initially input to start the chemical reaction, and therefore they make it easier and more likely that the substrates will react. So we'll briefly return to this animation and walk through step-by-step step what's happening using the proper terminology. So what we see here is the substrate called sucrose entering the active site of the enzyme, which is the name for the pocket that is tailor-made for a specific substrate or substrates. Once it's in there, the enzyme will transform the substrate into new products. In this case, the products are glucose and fructose. And you'll notice that after this process occurs, the enzyme returns to its original state. So the process can repeat over and over again. Uh, the enzyme can catalyze this same exact reaction repeatedly, and enzymes are reusable in that way. So this leads us to our first checkpoint of the lecture. Is the reaction that we've been talking about here a catabolic or an anabolic reaction? So now that you understand the basics of how enzymes work, we are going to take a look at some of the factors that can affect the enzyme activity rate, or in other words, how efficient an enzyme is at turning over chemical reactions. Enzymes are subject to environmental conditions impacting their ability to do their jobs because every enzyme has an ideal operating condition under which it works best. Some of the environmental conditions that impact enzyme activity rate include, for example, temperature. This graph right here shows us a plot of enzymatic activity on the y-axis versus temperature on the x-axis. And typical of any enzyme is to see a peak like this, where there is a temperature around which the enzyme operates at peak efficiency. We can see that for this enzyme, that peak occurs somewhere around 37 degrees Celsius. And so we could deduce that this is probably a graph representing an enzyme that is present in the human body because human body temperature measured in Celsius is 37 degrees. Just like enzymes prefer a specific temperature, each enzyme also has a preferred pH value or a level of acidity versus alkalinity at which it works best. This enzyme right here, we can see experiences a peak somewhere in the range of pH 5. So this is an, a, a slightly acidic pH 
In the human body, you would find uh, the pH 5 on the surface of the skin. You would find even lower pHs in the stomach, for example, and higher pHs in, for example, your saliva or your blood. So we could deduce that this might be an enzyme in the human body based on its temperature and an enzyme that might be found on the surface of the skin based upon its preferred pH. A third factor that impacts enzymatic activity rate is the concentration of the substrate, or in other words, the reactant that the enzyme is interacting with. Unlike the previous two factors of temperature and pH, which exhibit an optimal peak, Substrate concentration will increase uh, the enzymatic activity rate up to a certain point, after which it levels off and reaches what's called a saturation point. And the reason why this is the case is because as you supply more substrate to the enzyme, it can only work so fast up to a certain point. For example, the enzyme that we just had a look at in the animation, the one that breaks down sucrose into glucose and fructose, if you keep supplying that enzyme with a larger and larger amount of sucrose, it will work faster up to a certain point, after which it is completely saturated with sucrose and it just can't move any faster, even if you provide it with a higher concentration of sucrose to work with. So that's why substrate concentration levels off, unlike these other two in which there is a peak. Another factor that influences enzyme activity is the presence of molecules called inhibitors. Inhibitors do exactly what it sounds like they do. They inhibit the ability of an enzyme to do its job. So inhibitors are molecules that can impede the enzyme by either interacting with the active site or with a site that is separate from the active site but still influences the active site. The first class of inhibitors is called competitive inhibitors. And these are molecules that are similar enough to the structure of the active site that they can bind to it, or at least to part of it. And in doing so, they block the ability of the true substrate from entering the active site and undergoing transformation. So um, an analogy for a competitive inhibitor would be like if you came into class one day and someone else was sitting in your chair. They have blocked the ability uh, to access the active site, which is your chair. The other type of enzymatic active uh, inhibitor is called the non-competitive inhibitor, and these are molecules that bind to the enzyme, but not at the active site. Instead, they bind to something called the allosteric site. The allosteric, allosteric site is separate from the active site, but because it's part of the same enzyme, when this non-competitive inhibitor molecule binds here, it can change the shape of the active site so that the substrate can no longer fit. So to continue with our previous analogy, this would be like if you came into class one day and your chair was empty, but one of the legs was missing. Technically, the site is available, but its conformation and its shape is no longer compatible with your ability to interact with it. Now, it might sound like inhibitors are a bad thing, and sometimes they are, but also they can serve a real purpose for an organism through a process called feedback inhibition, which is this elegant system that helps stop cells from making more of a compound than they need. Usually, when reactions are taking place inside of cells, they don't involve a single step and a single enzyme. Rather, they take place over the course of a series of steps and a series of enzymes that transform an original substrate into intermediate products, which are then picked up by other enzymes and further transformed until you reach an eventual end product. But what happens when a cell has made enough of this end product and it doesn't need to create any more? To create any more would be wasteful. So how do we stop this pathway from proceeding? Well, this end product can actually go back and become a non-competitive inhibitor of an enzyme that occurs early in the pathway. In doing so, 
it will shut down the progress of the pathway at an early step so that the cell doesn't waste time and energy on creating more of the end product when it already has enough of what it needs. So in this way, inhibition can be useful for cells. Another way in which inhibition can be useful is that we, as scientists, have discovered that we can inhibit the ability of many bacterial enzymes to function properly by presenting them with these special molecules that interact with either their active site or their allosteric site. So many of our antibiotics are based upon this mechanism of inhibition. We can see in this animation right here, one of the two mechanisms of inhibition occurring, either competitive or non-competitive inhibition. So I want you to look at what's happening in this animation and tell me what you see. Do you see competitive or non-competitive inhibition? And I'll let that animation play out one more time before we move on. So let's take a moment to briefly review, because we've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time in terms of laying our foundational understanding of metabolism. We have discussed so far that microbes have complex metabolisms and that metabolism is defined as the chemical reactions involved in the buildup and breakdown of nutrients in an organism. Breaking down nutrients through catabolic chemical reactions produces ATP, or the cell's energy currency. Building up nutrients through anabolic chemical reactions consumes that same energy currency. And enzymes, a special class of catalytic proteins, make biological chemical reactions possible by speeding them up. So now we are finally ready to tackle the question of how microbes actually perform their metabolism. On a chemical level, what is going on when microbes perform these reactions? So microbes, like every living organism, need two things. They need an energy source and they need a carbon source. The molecules that make up biological organisms like proteins, fats, carbohydrates, DNA, they are all based on the element carbon. And so organisms need to take in carbon in some form in order to create these molecules. We can divide living organisms up into different groups based upon how they get their carbon and how they get their energy. So let's first talk about the two classifications of living organisms based upon the source of their carbon that goes into their metabolism. Heterotrophs are organisms that consume organic sources of carbon. Organic sources of carbon are loosely defined as sources of carbon that also have in combination with them hydrogen. So an example is C6H12O6. This is the chemical formula for the molecule glucose, a type of sugar. It is an organic source of carbon. Autotrophs, on the other hand, are organisms that consume inorganic sources of carbon. For example, carbon dioxide is considered an inorganic source of carbon. It's just carbon and oxygen, no hydrogen. Now, what about how we classify organisms based upon their energy source? There are also two classifications for microorganisms depending upon where they get their energy. Phototrophs use the sun as their energy source, and chemotrophs use chemicals as their energy source. So we can mix and match these different classifications Every living thing needs to have one of these carbon classifications and one of these energy classifications. And how an organism performs its metabolism depends upon which classifications it falls into.
So to practice the use of this information, in this checkpoint, I'd like you to classify humans based upon their carbon source and based upon their energy source. So as we said, organisms need to have a carbon source and an energy source, and so they need to belong to one or the other group in each category. But those categories can be mixed and matched. So some organisms are photoautotrophs. This means that they get their energy from the sun and they get their carbon from an inorganic source, probably carbon dioxide, by taking in gaseous carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. If an organism that is powered by the sun and takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere sounds familiar, that's because this is the type of metabolism performed by all plants, but it is also performed by some protists and some bacteria. Photoheterotrophs are a bit of a more rare metabolic classification because while photoheterotrophs get their energy from the sun, they do not take in carbon dioxide as their energy source like plants do, or pardon me, as their carbon source. They use uh, other organic carbon sources. Essentially, they both eat, they consume molecules like glucose, but they get their energy from the sun. Only some species of bacteria perform this metabolic lifestyle, so it's much more rare than photoautotrophs. Chemoautotrophs are also likewise very rare. These organisms get their energy from chemicals, but they take in carbon dioxide as their inorganic carbon source. Only some bacteria are chemoautotrophs. By far the most common metabolic lifestyle is to be a chemoheterotroph. This metabolism is performed by most bacteria, all fungi, and all animals, which includes helminths, of course. This means that an organism gets its energy from chemicals and its carbon source from an organic source, and oftentimes these two come in the form of the same molecule. For most chemoheterotrophs, that molecule is mainly a carbohydrate. Most microbes obtain the majority of their energy and their carbon by breaking down carbohydrates. Usually that carbohydrate ends up being the molecule glucose. Glucose is the molecule that you see featured on the screen right here. As you can see, it's made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. The chemical formula for it is C6H12O6, and that's because there are six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens in it. However, there are different ways that this molecule can be dismantled and its energy extracted by microscopic organisms. There are two major pathways by which glucose can be broken down. They're called cellular respiration and fermentation. They work quite differently, but the goal of both is essentially the same. Both pathways oxidize the molecule glucose to generate those energy currency molecules of ATP. To oxidize a chemical compound means to extract its electrons away from it. Because within a molecule or an atom, it is the electrons that really store the energy. So if the goal of both of these processes is to oxidize glucose, that essentially means the goal is to extract the electrons, extract the energy, and use that energy to generate ATP. Here's a basic overview of what the metabolic pathway for cellular respiration and fermentation look like. Essentially, both are two different ways of breaking down the glucose molecule. And they start in a similar way, but after their very first step, the two pathways diverge from each other. Some of this should look familiar to you from a prerequisite course, Bio 181. There are four steps involved in breaking down a glucose molecule through cellular respiration. It starts with glycolysis, moves into pyruvate oxidation, then the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle followed by the electron transport chain. 
Fermentation, on the other hand, starts with glycolysis and then ends with a single additional step called fermentation. We're going to talk about both of these pathways for breaking down the carbohydrate glucose, starting with cellular respiration. So cellular respiration is a four-step pathway, and remember that the goal of this pathway is to essentially dismantle glucose by taking away its electrons step by step and then using those electrons to generate ATP. What we are going to see as we walk through these steps is that glucose will have its electrons extracted during glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the Krebs cycle, and then in the final step of the electron transport chain, all of those electron energies will be used to generate ATP molecules. Now there are two very important molecules that are involved in this electron extraction process. These molecules are called FADH2 and NADH. Here they are depicted very cutely but also very inaccurately as little electron mail carriers because their goal and their role that they play is to gather up electrons from glucose and its derivatives and carry them to the electron transport chain where their energy is used to generate ATP. Obviously, these molecules do not look like little electron mail carriers inside the cell. They look like this, but I don't expect you to know the structures of them. All I want you to know is the difference between their empty and their full forms. When one of these carriers, NAD, is empty of electrons, it's called NAD+. Plus. And after it picks up a set of electrons, it is transformed into NADH. So this is full. When it drops off those electrons, it goes back to being NAD+. Plus. So this is a reusable electron carrier that can bounce between these two forms depending upon whether it is empty or full and carrying electrons. Likewise, FAD is a very similar molecule the empty form of which is called FAD, and the full form is called FADH2. When it drops electrons off, it goes back to being FAD. So a healthy cell has a constant supply of NAD plus and FAD molecules sitting around to use as electron carriers to gather up all those electrons from glucose and derivatives of glucose. So let's take a look at how this works. The first step of cellular respiration is called glycolysis. And what I'm going to show you on each of these slides is a step-by-step -step look at the process with a demonstration of how the glucose molecule gets transformed through each step. I don't expect you to know what the structure of this molecule looks like at each step, but I have added them in here for your benefit to see how the transformation takes place. This is a glucose molecule. It looks a little bit different than the glucose molecule that we saw before, and that's because most of the carbon atoms have been taken away, and in this organic chemistry format, you are simply meant to assume that every little angle here represents a implied carbon atom. So this is still glucose, it just looks a little bit differently. What glycolysis does is it takes the glucose molecule and it essentially breaks it open and splits it in half. By breaking it open and splitting it in half, some of the electrons are able to be extracted and picked up by those electron carriers, NAD+, which are transformed into NADH. Specifically, for every glucose molecule that goes through glycolysis and gets split in half, two electron carriers are able to fill up with electrons. Another thing that happens in glycolysis is two of the uncharged form of these energy currency molecules, ADP, are able to be directly and immediately charged up into ATP. The result after this happens is that glucose gets transformed into two pyruvic acid molecules, which look like this. Now, it might be difficult to visualize, but each one of these is roughly half of a glucose molecule with some electrons missing. 
you can imagine that if you took this molecule and you stacked it on top of this molecule, you would get something that looks like this original hexagon right here. So what we've done is break glucose in half, and when we do that, the molecules that result are called pyruvic acid. This is a pyruvic acid, and this is a pyruvic acid. Now at this point, some of the energy from glucose has been extracted, but these pyruvic acids still have more energy left to give. And so they are going to go through another step called pyruvate oxidation. And pyruvate oxidation is exactly what it sounds like. Remember we said that oxidation is the process by which electrons are removed from a molecule. In pyruvate oxidation, each pyruvic acid has more of its electrons extracted by the electron carrier NAD+. Now, note that this is happening twice because we saw two pyruvic acids come out of glycolysis but I've only shown you one of those pyruvic acids here for simplicity. Something else that happens when this breakdown takes place is a molecule of carbon dioxide is released. This molecule of carbon dioxide no longer has energy left to give, so it is now considered a waste product. One molecule of carbon dioxide is broken off of each pyruvic acid, and because there are two pyruvic acids, that means that two carbon dioxide molecules come out of this process for every glucose molecule that begins it. After this transformation has taken place, the result is that each pyruvic acid is now it's transformed into a different chemical compound that we call acetyl-CoA. If we take a look at the chemical structure of acetyl-CoA, and compare it to the structure of pyruvic acid, we can see that they are somewhat similar to each other. For example, if we were to take this molecule and drag it over here and superimpose it on pyruvic acid, we would see that it still has the same basic shape, but we can also see that it's missing some components as well, and other things have been substituted. So there's a transformation that has taken place here. These pyruvic acids are now called acetyl-CoA's, and they've lost more of their energy as well as some of their structure. But just because they've lost more of their structure doesn't mean that they don't have more energy left to give. And in the third step of cellular respiration, called the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, these acetyl-CoA's are essentially going to be completely dismantled and all of the remaining energy is going to be extracted. This happens through a complex series of eight chemical reactions that I don't expect you to memorize, but there are eight transformations that take place that turn acetyl-CoA into citric acid, then into isocitric acid, then into alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, succinic acid, fumaric acid, malic acid, oxalacetic acid, and at the end of all of those transformations, the result is that a large amount of electrons have been extracted. Six NAD plus molecules are able to fill up on electrons from the two acetyl-CoA's that feed into this process. In addition, two FAD molecules, this was the other electron carrier that we talked about previously, are able to fill up on electrons. And in addition, two molecules of what is called GDP, a cousin of ADP, this is called guanosine diphosphate, but it is essentially equivalent to ADP. They are able to directly get recharged up to their fully charged version of GTP. As I said, by the end of this process, acetyl-CoA has been completely dismantled, and the result is that there's nothing left except for waste products. Specifically, four carbon dioxide molecules are released. Now, what happens to all of this carbon dioxide molecule? Well, if you're a human, you exhale it, you breathe it out. If you're a bacterium, it just diffuses out of the cell and into the environment.
So at the end of the first three steps of cellular respiration, what the cell has accomplished is it has performed a pretty fruitful harvest of electrons from glucose and all of the derivatives. By the end of the Krebs cycle, anything that was left of glucose has been completely dismantled, transformed into waste products, and all of the energy has been extracted by these electron carrier molecules. Now, all of the electron carriers that were stocked up on during the first three steps are going to travel to the electron transport chain where they will be put to use in creating ATP molecules. What we can see in this diagram right here is the molecules NADH and FADH2 arriving at the electron transport chain, the infrastructure of which is shown right here. We can see a layer of membrane, and in that membrane are these big blue blobs that represent special transporter proteins. The NADH and FADH electron carriers arrive at the electron transport chain and they drop off their electrons. When they drop off their electrons to these proteins, the proteins will use the energy in the electrons to actively pump hydrogen ions, which are just sitting around and readily available, from one side of the membrane to the other. The electrons get passed from protein to protein, and each step of the way, the protein uses the energy in the electron to transport hydrogen ions unidirectionally from one side of the membrane to the other. At the end of this process, the electrons are totally spent of all of their energy, and with nowhere else to go, the proteins will dump these spent electrons on a molecule of oxygen here. This is why oxygen plays an important role in metabolism, because it serves as the final acceptor of these energy-poor electrons at the end of the process. When the electrons are added to oxygen, it picks up some hydrogen ions along with them and is transformed into H2O. That H2O just becomes part of the normal cytoplasm of the cell. Now, the final question is, how do we get ATP out of all of this? Well, over the course of the movement of the electrons, all of these hydrogen ions have been pumped and actively concentrated on one side of the membrane. And molecules have a tendency to want to spread themselves out through a process called diffusion. Therefore, these hydrogen ions really want to move back to the other side of the membrane where they won't be quite so densely packed. They do this by diffusing through a special enzyme here that is called ATP synthase. ATP synthase works like a water wheel. When the hydrogen ions rush through it in an effort to spread themselves out across to the other side of the membrane, it will spin like a rotary motor, and that spinning motion will be used to capture ATP, pardon me, ADP molecules and charge them back up to ATP. How efficient is this process? Well, for every one singular glucose molecule that starts this whole process off, by the end of the electron transport chain, ATP synthase should have been able to generate 34 ATP. And this is in addition to the two GDP that are generated in the Krebs cycle and the two ATP that are generated in glycolysis for overall an approximate total of 38 ATP coming out of cellular respiration. Now let's take a moment to talk about where this process is happening inside of cells. You may remember that cellular respiration takes place inside of the mitochondria, a special organelle that is dedicated to this process. However, 
mitochondria are only found in eukaryotes, not in prokaryotes. So in prokaryotes, the electron transport chain happens across the inner plasma membrane. Because there is no mitochondria inside of a prokaryote, nor any other internal structure, prokaryotes cannot conduct cellular respiration inside the mitochondria. They conduct it inside the normal part of their cell, and the electron transport chain happens across their inner plasma membrane. In eukaryotes, this is where the electron transport chain is happening across the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So now that we've walked through cellular respiration, I want you to think back to each of the stages that we talked about and tell me in which stage are the majority of electrons collected, meaning where are the majority of electrons gathered? Not where they are expended, not where they are used, but where are they collected up? So what we just walked through, I have been referring to as cellular respiration. But to be more accurate, what we've just talked about is called aerobic cellular respiration. And as we will learn further in our next chapter's lecture, aerobic essentially means in the presence of oxygen. We saw that aerobic cellular respiration requires oxygen in the electron transport chain because oxygen serves as the final acceptor of the energy poor electrons at the end of the chain. There is, however, another version of cellular respiration that some rare and special types of bacteria can perform called anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic cellular respiration looks exactly like aerobic cellular respiration with one detail changed. Instead of oxygen serving as the final acceptor of electrons at the end of this process, a different molecule serves as the final acceptor. Some of the more common variations include the use of sulfate, nitrate, or sulfur as the eventual molecule on which these electrons land. So it is possible for some organisms, namely some rare types of bacteria, to perform cellular respiration even in the absence of oxygen if they have the unique metabolic capability to use one of these three variants as the receiver of oxygen at the end of the process. Now another process that can be performed in the absence of oxygen, and one that is much more common than anaerobic cellular respiration, is fermentation. So now we'll move on to talking about the lower branch of this diagram right here. Let me pose a hypothetical to you. Let's say there is an organism that cannot perform anaerobic cellular respiration. In other words, in order to perform the electron transport chain, it needs to have oxygen at the end of this process. But what happens if there's no oxygen there anymore for those electrons to land on? What would happen is this chain would rapidly get backed up with electrons. Electrons would arrive at this protein and have nowhere else to go. This means that electrons wouldn't be able to transfer from this protein to the third protein. And likewise, they wouldn't be able to transfer from the first protein to the second. And eventually the backup would get so bad that NADH and FADH2 would no longer be able to unload their electrons at the end of the chain here. So essentially what you would have is if taking oxygen away takes away the ability to drop off electrons, then NADH will no longer be able to unload its electrons and return to its empty state of NAD+. This is a problem because a cell has a finite supply of NAD+. And these molecules of NAD+, once they unload their electrons, travel straight back to glycolysis 
where they can be reused to pick up more electrons. So if NAD can no longer regenerate itself, then this shuts down not just the electron transport chain, but the previous steps that require the use of NAD to pick up more electrons. Now, in the absence of oxygen, this means that the cell is losing out on a massive amount of ATP because the last three steps of this process generate a grand total of approximately 36 ATP for the cell. However, as an emergency backup operation, the cell can manage to keep glycolysis running and generate those measly two ATP by performing fermentation as an alternative way to regenerate NAD plus molecules. What fermentation does is it takes the electrons gathered up from glycolysis and it transfers those electrons onto an organic molecule, not oxygen, but some organic molecule. This allows for the regeneration of empty NAD plus molecules so that at the very least glycolysis can continue to run and generate 2 ATP, which is, of course, not nearly as much as 38 ATP, but it's enough for many cells to survive on under anaerobic conditions when oxygen is absent. So to give you a more detailed picture of what happens here, glucose will go through glycolysis per normal, and in the process, two sets of electrons will be gathered up, and two molecules of ADP will be charged up to ATP. Per normal, two pyruvic acid molecules will result from the breaking of glucose in half. But then instead of channeling those pyruvic acid molecules into the Krebs cycle, they'll be channeled into an alternative process called fermentation, where these two NADH molecules will dump their electrons off on another molecule, just solely for the purpose of being able to regenerate NAD pluses and allowing glycolysis to continue to run and generate these two ATP. So the bottom line is that fermentation is much less efficient and it produces many fewer ATP than cellular respiration, but it does it quickly and it does it when conditions are anaerobic and there is no other option for the cell. Now there are multiple types of fermentation that occur. The two main ones that we are going to narrow our focus to for the purposes of this lecture are alcohol fermentation and lactic acid fermentation. Some microbes, when they perform fermentation, generate the product of ethanol and carbon dioxide. These two products come out of alcohol fermentation, whereas other species of microbes that perform lactic acid fermentation generate lactic acid as the final product, but no carbon dioxide gas. As I said, these are just two limited examples of some of the more common types of fermentation that are performed by microbial species, but there are also a wide variety of types of fermentation that are utilized in different ways. For example, mixed acid fermentation is used to generate acetic acid, succinic acid, ethanol, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen gas, and this type of acid is used to produce vinegar. Propionic fermentation is used in the making of Swiss cheese. Butane diol fermentation is used to generate Chardonnay wine. Butyric fermentation is involved in the making of butter. But lactic acid and alcohol fermentation are the ones that we are going to focus on, so let's take a bit of a closer look at each of those. One of the main genuses that performs lactic acid fermentation is the genus Lactobacillus. Lactobacillus are commercially used to generate yogurt, pickles, sauerkraut, and other varieties of products that require acidic environments, acidic conditions. Um, they're also a probiotic that you can take to improve the uh, condition, the acidic pH condition of your stomach. 
So you may have seen that there are lactobacillus acidophilus tablets that you can get in the pharmacy, which literally includes this bacteria that performs this type of fermentation. It's an important component of your gut microbiome. Virtually everyone has lactobacillus acidophilus in their stomach right now. Alcohol fermentation is performed by a variety of species as well, but one of the main ones that, that we want to focus on is Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which we mentioned in our first chapter's lecture, literally means sugar-eating fungus that brews beer. This species of yeast is used uh, in fermentation conditions to generate beer, wine, and spirits. And it is also used to generate ethanol that is used for biofuels. Saccharomyces is also an important component of your gut microbiome. However, consequences can result if there is an overgrowth of this species. Autobrewery syndrome is what happens when you have too much Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast in your gut and it literally ferments alcohol inside of your body, which can lead to all of the normal consequences of alcohol consumption. There have actually been multiple cases of people who were uh, caught driving under the influence and were able to demonstrate that they suffered from auto brewery syndrome. And although they had not been drinking alcohol, their bodies were generating alcohol through fermentation due to an overgrowth of saccharomyces in their guts. Now, in the laboratory, there is a test that can be performed and that will be performed in one of the labs this semester called the fermentation test, which allows you to, to determine essentially what type of fuel source a microorganism can use and break down through the fermentation process. The setup for the fermentation test is simple but elegant. It involves using a broth media that has a pH indicator in it, as well as an inverted Durham tube, which is a small upside down glass tube that is placed inside of the broth in the larger tube. When you inoculate this tube with a species of microorganism, and provide it with a specific source of sugar, for example, glucose. If that species is capable of fermenting glucose into an acidic product, then the acid byproduct will result in a drop in the pH and cause the pH indicator to change from red to yellow. Another possible outcome of the fermentation test is that gas products will be produced, such as carbon dioxide, and evidence of this will be seen in the formation of a bubble in the Durham tube. The purpose of the inverted Durham tube is to capture any gaseous byproducts. So essentially, there are four possible outcomes of the fermentation test, which you can see in a lineup here. It's possible that there's neither gas nor acid in the fermentation tube, this counts as a negative result. It's also possible that there is a gas production, so a bubble, but no acid. Finally, you might get an acidic color change from red to yellow, but no gas. And then lastly, there might be a combination of both gas production, a bubble, as well as an acidic color change. So based upon what you now know about members of the genus Lactobacillus and the type of fermentation they perform and its byproducts, tell me which of these four outcomes, A, B, C, or D, would result from culturing a microbe from the Lactobacillus genus in the fermentation tube. And likewise, I want you to tell me the same thing but about a microbe from the Saccharomyces genus. And as you do this, I want you to make the assumption that alcohol is not acidic enough to result in a pH drop. Now, as long as we're talking about fermentation, 
I feel like it's worthwhile to mention that there are some pretty cool things going on in the genetic engineering space as far as fermentation goes, because vinegar, Swiss cheese, yogurt, alcohol are all cool and interesting products, but they're not nearly as cool and interesting as some of the fermentation byproducts that companies are now looking to produce. For example, there's a company out there called Bolt Threads that is generating spider silk fibers through fermentation and using them to create high quality, um, essentially fabrics that are, that are made into um, clothing items. There's also uh, a TED talk, which I've linked here, on the use of fermentation to generate uh, pigments that are more environmentally friendly than some of the pigments and dyes that are currently used to color clothing. So I'll link that TED Talk here and in the description of the video. Lastly, we are going to leave off here with a final checkpoint where we can see a bacterium from the genus Desulfovibrio. Bacteria in this genus use sulfur as their final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. So I want you to tell me what metabolic process they perform. Aerobic cellular respiration, anaerobic cellular respiration, or fermentation. And after this checkpoint, you are finished with chapter 8.